Hello everyone and welcome back to the second part of my Italian Unification series. In this video I will be covering the events in the Expedition of the Thousands between 1860 to 1861. If you want to know more about what happened beforehand in detail, be sure to check out my previous video on the matter and to subscribe for more Italian content. Let's start right away. The expedition of the Thousand was a very ambitious and a somewhat spontaneous military campaign led by the highly celebrated General Giuseppe Garibaldi, where he intended to take down the whole Kingdom of Two Sicilies under Francis II. He managed to succeed and in less than a year he was able to unite the two ends of the peninsula under one flag against most odds. Even if you hated republicanism and liberalism, you couldn't help but to be amazed in such expedition. Overall, the Risorgimento, which means the regrowth, is one of the most romanticized historical events in Italian public perception. Not because we were told lies, but because we learned about it in a very superficial way, and many things were left out because they would break the simplicity of the fairy tale like narrative. Most of our main sources are from Republican soldiers who fought along Garibaldi or publicly supported him. So they are biased, of course, but in a good way. The negative reputation of Francis II increasingly improved the support for Garibaldi's cause. Everyone could agree that Garibaldi did an amazing job out there and he will forever be remembered as one of the greatest generals in history. However, in the last couple of years, people have started to grow doubtful of certain aspects of the expedition of the thousands. Certain questions started to come up, like what were Garibaldi's real aims for the expedition and the land he conquered? And how did he single-handedly destroy the whole Neapolitan army? I will try to answer both of these questions in this as I narrate the events. Last time, after the failed attempts of Carlo Alberto to take Lombardy, Sicily to get a constitution, and Mazzini and Garibaldi to establish a republic in Rome between 1848 and 1849, Piedmont and France were able to take over Lombardy and the central duchies in 1859, as well as the region of Romagna, which was at first under the control of the Pope. Pope Pius IX was convinced by Napoleon III to give out that region to Piedmont for a couple of reasons. First of all, Napoleon was afraid of the southern expansion the small kingdom had gained, and he feared that Piedmont would try and take back the cities of Savoy and Nice from France because they were not able to take over Veneto as they initially intended, so Romagna became a substitute. The Pope also hoped that by giving up some of his lands, Piedmont would leave him alone, at least for a couple of years. It didn't work out very well, but I will get into that in a minute. As I said previously, Napoleon, in exchange for the help in Lombardy, got the two cities of Savoy and Nice. This part of the deal outraged many liberals and republicans in Italy because it showed that Piedmont was not in for ideological reasons but for the land and power. In addition, the trade they made essentially showed that they were ready to give up Italian cities if it meant that they could get more land back. One of the most outraged was General Giuseppe Garibaldi himself who was born in Nice. Many think that this was one of the main reasons for why Garibaldi led the expedition of the thousands, challenging Cavour's leadership. What many fail to mention when talking about the relationship between Garibaldi and Cavour is that the two hated each other and they were already on a thin line. It used to be just about a difference in ideologies before Cavour gave up Garibaldi's hometown. Garibaldi was a strong supporter of Mazzini's views and just like him, he wanted a fully democratic Italy. He worked beside Cavour regardless as he thought that after all, they had the same aims and their differences shouldn't stop progress. He would eventually get democracy afterwards. But now it was personal. Cavour kindly asked him to stay in Piedmont and to not do anything stupid and Garibaldi ignored him and sailed south. 
When the news broke out, Cavour had to try and convince all the ambassadors in Turin that Piedmont had nothing to do with it. It was a hard task since it was hard to buy, and even if it did, it would put Piedmont in a bad light and make them seem as incompetent and not able to control their generals. There is a funny event involving the ambassador of the Kingdom of Two Sicilies, Conofari, who as soon as he, as he heard the news, went first to the foreign ministry, then to Cavour's house to protest, but he could not find anyone, probably because Cavour was actively trying to ignore him or avoid him, and he instead shared his complaints with the internal minister Farini, who in response raised his hands and said, you are the first I hear this from, I have nothing to do with it. Add some Italian end signs to the mix and it would end up being a funny sketch. The politicians and journalists alike also asked Victor Emmanuel about this and he responded similarly to Cavour. However, deep down he was in favor of the campaign and it meant more land for him. Another person who played a huge role in convincing Garibaldi to depart was Rosolino Pilo, a Sicilian Republican, who helped to create a revolt in Sicily shortly before Garibaldi's arrival. Garibaldi recruited 189 volunteers, the largest number of volunteers came from Lombardy, other significant numbers of volunteers came from Veneto, Genoa and uh, Tuscany. There were about 45 extra Sicilian volunteers and 46 Neapolitan volunteers, but only 11 from Rome and the Papal State. 33 foreigners joined the expedition, amongst them was Istvan Tour and three other Hungarians, and 14 Italians from Trentino, a region which would be added to the kingdom after World War I, and was 50-50 German and Italian. They called themselves the Redcoats, because their uniform was red as it was the cheapest color available. They were also poorly equipped, with all muskets, and lacked proper discipline. They sailed in two big steamships, which were donated by a company which was sympathetic to Garibaldi's cause, but they had to stage a robbery so, so they wouldn't have to pay consequences by the Piemontese government. They named the ships Il Piemonte and Il Lombardo. They sailed from Quarto, a town close to Genoa, on May the 5th and arrived in Marsala, Sicily, six days later. Garibaldi quickly won the love of the Sicilian people, many Sicilians joined their ranks, including the future Prime Minister Crispi, and soon after the Red Coat Army tried to liberate the local town of Catalafirmi. The garrison was overrun by the locals and so it was easy for the Red Coats to win, but a well-trained Neapolitan army came shortly after and so all the real battle started. The Battle of Catalafirmi was generally inconclusive but served as a boost of morale for the Redcoats and a huge blow for the Neapolitan troops. This was due to the sudden order by the Neapolitan general Landi to retreat. This act of incompetence took everyone by surprise and it was probably due to an overestimation of Garibaldi's abilities. Regardless, when he went back to Naples to report on the defeat, he resigned. Both sides lost 30 people and had 150 of them injured. After this battle in mid-May, the Redcoats would expand and take control over the entire island for the following two months. By the end of May, they would take Palermo, the biggest city in the island, and proceed east. The Neapolitan troops retreated at Milazzo in order to stop Garibaldi's advance to Messina, which would give him an access to Calabria. They were also still in control of the eastern coastal cities of Syracuse and Augusta, which were heavily fortified and would have not been worth attacking as it, was, uh, as it would have meant heavy losses for Garibaldi. He then settled just for Milazzo, and in mid-July Garibaldi was able to conquer the town, at the expense of 800 men. The Neapolitans only lost 300. This Pyrrhic victory still allowed them access to the mainland, which was still seen as a huge success by the Redcoats, and their losses were recovered thanks to the large influx of local volunteers. With the conquest of Sicily, Garibaldi gained a force of 24,000 men, which he would take to the mainland. In mid-August, Garibaldi was asked by Cavour not to sail there and wait for, for their orders. As everyone expected, he sailed to the mainland shortly after anyway. A good portion of the Neapolitan armies in Sicily had joined Garibaldi's army or had went home. A similar situation happened in Calabria and Apulia. The Bourbons had 15,000 soldiers stationed there, but no conflict actually happened. 
In September Garibaldi entered Naples with relative ease, thanks to most of the Napolitan officials and soldiers who had switched side. Meanwhile, Francis II took refuge in Gaeta and Marshal Josue Ritucci rebuilt the army in Capua. He gathered a discreet force of 25,000 well-trained Neapolitan soldiers. And on the 30th of September, while Garibaldi was trying to march his 24,000 troops and some allies across the Volturno River, Ritucci caught up with him and started the battle the following day. Both sides fought bravely, and on paper the Battle of Volturno was a decisive victory for Francis II whose presence in battle was a great morale boost for the troops. Unfortunately, both sides were exhausted and the losses were big for both sides, so the Neapolitans were unable to retake Caserta and Naples. The Neapolitan generals suggested to reorganize in Gaeta, so they retreated from Capua. Garibaldi was now stuck and just could not win this by himself, so he was forced to ask Victor Emmanuel for help who marched with his reinforcements through the Adriatic lands of the Papal State, Marche and Abruzzo, who he also annexed. This uncalled for event created controversy among the Catholic nations, but no one in Italy really cared. Meanwhile, Garibaldi called for plebiscites in the southern lands in, on October 21st, and the results were in their favor. Finally, on October 26th, Garibaldi gave up all the lands he conquered to King Victor Emmanuel in a meeting in Teano that would make history. This was when the missing lands in the south automatically fell under Piedmont. Southern Italy was now free for Bourbon rule. The siege of Gaeta ended with Garibaldi's and Piedmont's troops were able to block the port, blocking the access to any potential foreign aids and took the fortress on February 1861. Francis fled to Rome, but he would not stay there for long. It was done. Italy had now gained most of its territory. The Italian kingdom declared its independence, and the first country to recognize them was England. Victor Emmanuel, in his first speech to the parliament, praised Garibaldi's bravery, Cavour's professionalism, and England's aid during the campaign, as well as the courage the Italian people had shown throughout the struggle for the unification. It was a long ride, but Italy still had many problems, many divisions. The following quote sums up the situation pretty well, and most politicians and writers at the time agreed with the following. It comes from the famous writer Massimo D'Azeglio, and he will be remembered for saying, Italy is done, the Italians are still to be done. In conclusion, let's answer the question I initially brought up. What were Garibaldi's real aims, the expedition, and the land he conquered? There were many factors that led to the expedition, the arguments with Cavour, the Sicilian revolts, the active support from foreign powers that encouraged Garibaldi to start his campaign, but also his own bold initiative, which he would push him to do something similar in the future. What he intended to do with the lands is uncertain. He initially declared himself dictator of Sicily and Naples after he conquered them, but many sources agree that he did not have any political ambitions, as he was not interested in it in the slightest. So I think it's unlikely that he intended to make his own dominion in the south, also because it would actively go against his views of a united Italy. I think that what he ultimately wanted to do was to win over the two Sicilies single-handedly and make a deal with Victor Emmanuel from an equal standing, but since he asked for help, he could not really do that, so he gave up the South with little to no conditions. How did he single-handedly destroy the whole Neapolitan army? This question is actually easier to answer and maybe it's one of the most agreed upon. Neapolitan incompetence of nearly every position of power except maybe Ritucci. Francis II was brave, I will give him that, but that's all I will give him. In defense of the two Sicilies, most kingdoms go through some years of uncertainty over the new king, but if Landi had actually been competent down in Sicily, all of this betraying by Calabria and Apulia would not have happened. So most of the blame goes to Landi, right? Well, many blame Garibaldi for using corruption over the Neapolitan officials, but why would they take a bribe in the first place? So yes, it's more Naples' fault if they lost, more than it's Garibaldi's credit to win. So, I hope this gives you a bigger and more, and more detailed picture of the expedition of the thousands. Thank you so much for watching, I will see you next time.